Welcome people back to uh, two degrees down. Yeah, I mean, as you can see, this is uh, just north of Brisbane. We at Caboolture Airfield. Lovely Sunday afternoon. It's about four o'clock. It's a little bit chilly in that. And what we're going to surprise you, we, we're going to, what I'm going to do is a bit of a, uh, before I go touring that, I want to just do a review of the places around Brisbane and that. I saw it about a week ago. So what I'm surprised I've got here is I've got a surprise. We're going to do a review on the Tiger Moth. So what I'm going to do is just turn the camera around. As you can see, we have the Tiger Moth. And we have a Tiger Moth pilot, <laughs> Conrad. <laughs> Welcome to two degrees down. <laughs> he flies this Tiger Moth. So tell me, Conrad, how long have you had this aircraft for? For about 15 years. 15 years, can you believe it? And it is, uh, what year is it? 1939. 1939. DH 82A Tiger Moth. Oh, okay. And um, how many hours have you got on this? I've been in Tiger Moths in general about a thousand. A thousand? That that is quite a lot of that is quite a lot of hours to have on type and that you know you don't really get that these days, uh, especially on these old girls. Um, let's just start off here in the front of the cockpit. So um, you 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 fly from the back end. That's right. You fly from the back. Yeah. Most attractive part is the the compass. This is complex to use, and uh, if one forgets how to use it, it can be quite. Uh, Scary when you're on cross country. <laughs> okay, I'm sure it's happened once or twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a typical British compass. That's right. And yeah, we have naturally the stick and rudder, which is there's the stick. Of course, the rudders at the back. So this is real stick and rudder flying. Stick and rudder fly. You know, none of this fly by wire computer business. As you can see inside there, it's this very old instrumentation. And we've got a bit of a fold down door here, and we've got a leather jacket there to keep you warm and that must have been the previous owner this was the previous owner's uncle he was uh, he used to fly uh, i think uh, either mosquitoes or something in, uh, in mediterranean mediterranean there so, oh. but he was he was fine he didn't die or anything it's just that he served there okay yeah and as you can see he's got a bit of a unique little um mechanism of opening it there you, you pull that little business like that together opens it up and I, I can almost take you a bet the mosquito had the same sort of compass as well. Yeah, well, it's very similar compasses. <laughs> okay. And you've just come back from a flight? Yeah, you just went west. You turned uh, west for about, about an hour. It was really good. Okay, and was it cold? It was very cold. So, as, as, as you can see, folks, this is the kind of setup you need to, to wear. You know what I mean? You, you need the full flight suit, a bit of boots, nothing, nothing worse than flying cold, cold feet. And then um, a flying jacket as well. Uh, this is a nice uh, ex South African Air Force jacket. Oh, uh, yeah. But um, I don't normally use this, I use a sheepskin. And I thought it was going to be warmer today, but it wasn't a little bit colder than I expected. The cold just 500 foot above the ground, it was really cold. Okay. But, uh, this, of course, you have the leather helmet, but inside is the cloth one. And the leather one's just to protect you from the wind and the cold. Mostly okay. the wind. And of I course, see. the goggles. The goggles, okay. Yeah. Because you don't want any bugs or anything flying in your eyes. That's a big problem because you won't see. <laughs> okay. Not that let's... one closes one's eyes normally. <laughs> okay, let's just take a walk around uh, okay. around the aircraft. And, and as you can see, this is uh, all these old aircrafts. You can see they made them out of uh, fabric and dope. And a lot of, um, got a bit of sun glare there. Sorry about that. We're going to come around to the, 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 the engine. So you get a lot of oil spray in these old engines. And uh, but the engine's original. This is this engine was actually made by Ford. I mean, uh, uh, Christian. Uh, let's just go on the other side and have a look. It's uh, General Motors. General Motors. Holden. Uh. Holden. A bit of competition there for Holden. Holden. Uh, it was actually Holden that made these engines. Oh really? Tipsy Major Holden down at Melbourne. I don't know if you can see that over there. Oh okay. Well, I didn't yeah. know that. Uh, so they were contracted to to, to make them because the British couldn't uh, keep up with demand. They could make the airframes, but they couldn't make the engines, and eventually they stopped both. So then Holden uh, got a, a license 
There we go, a little bit of uh, history that I didn't know. So there we go for the, all the Holden uh, owners there. You know, yeah. you can um, ride your car with a bit of pride. And uh, <laughs> what's also a little bit uh, something which the British won't like, these engines were actually better than the British ones. <laughs> okay, do not tell that to you. This will make it too loud. They might upset them when they're That's having right. their tea and sandwiches or something That's like right. that. <laughs> Coffee the cucumber. And what kind of horsepower are we looking at here? 135 horsepower. 135. And is that a, would you consider that quite a quite a bit for a two seater aircraft sufficient? Yes, it's sufficient for two seater aircraft. Okay. Yeah, and I mean it was designed as a trainer, so that was enough for the training of its day. And the American end aircraft have a lot more powerful motors and they're more powerful aircraft. Okay, trainers. okay. That's German and stuff like that. And uh, but these ones were just the British ones, and they went throughout the whole world you know, pre World War Two. Uh, they have that one contract for training aircraft. And that's why they went throughout the whole world. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Canada, Australia, uh, South Africa, Rhodesia, um, England, and uh, well, most of Commonwealth countries. Like, uh, to train up pilots for World War II. Okay. And that was actually pre World War II because they expected the war coming. Yeah, okay, okay. And I see uh, we've got a wooden propeller here. Yes, that's correct. The nice thing about the wooden propellers is they're not life, so you can keep flying them. Inspect them every now and again. The aircraft engineers inspect them, but the good thing about them is they laugh. And also, if you have a prop strike on the ground, it usually doesn't damage the rest of the engine because it's not metal. Metal. Oh, the problem okay. with metal, these ones just snap. And that's why they use them probably because they're training, because a lot of them would nose over, break the prop, and the engine leg. Yeah. Be fine. I heard somewhere that the ones they did try out with uh, metal ones, but it yeah. wasn't success at all. No, it's too much uh, weight on the um, on the crankshaft. Okay, okay. There we go. So there we go. A good old wooden propeller. And um, so you actually, when you start this, you actually, uh, there's no starter. You, no, you throw you it. Throw it over. You go back four times, just blow it out, and you prime it. How you prime it is you just uh, tickle this little thing over here, they call tickle it, and it floods the hold, okay. the inlet manifold. And you can see it trickling out the bottom. That means oh. it's flooded. And okay. you pull it through eight times, but you've got to make sure the other direction as if it's turning. But you've got to make sure that you always stand clear because you've got to treat this as live the whole time. Yeah, so yeah. Set up everything, make sure your chocks are in, and then start it up. I see. With all the correct settings and everything. And they always refer to these, usually these old, as, as girls, old girls, or she's, yes. and they like a good tickle. <laughs> 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 Moving on to the undercarriage and the wheels here. Yes. As you can see, the, you know, to the normal person who's not really involved in aviation, this looks like a, a very, you know, bald tyre. <laughs> yeah, this is normal tyre for the Tiger Moth. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, they do have the little grooves in them, as you can see there, just to help with a bit of traction, but they were most, mostly made for grass runways. So the idea was that you can slide a little bit on the, on the, on the grass as you trying to learn to fly. Oh, okay. So it's a lot more forgiving. So as you can see, you know, going bald is not all that bad. You know, it, it's, 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 <laughs> there's a bit of it's benefit of in it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we we're talking about this, this fabric. Um, yep. What is this called? Second night, is this it? This is second night. The, they used to be Irish linen, which is just cotton. Oh, and the yes. problem with them, they had to be covered every five years. With these ones, you get 25 years. Oh, well, that's quite a bit. And I suppose it costs quite a bit of a yeah, coin a to, yeah. to get it covered and maintained. But as you can see, it, it has like a sort of a drum appearance to it. Yes, being taught that, I think they heat it and they put tens and tensions it up. Oh, okay. Yeah, and also with the glues, the dokes that they put on. Okay. It tensions it up. The silver color is good in sunlight because it uh, reflects the sunlight because you get longer wear on the, uh, on the fabric. But they do put a silver coat underneath anyway, you know, on, on all the, the wings to protect the wings from the UV rays. I see. Yeah. And we've got a little pipe business here. Pitto. Okay. The airspeed indicator and also the pressure instruments inside there. You've got the two pipes going in. Okay. And every second year, I think it's every two years, they test the pressures to make sure your altitude as you're flying and your air pressures are good. And they can adjust it if necessary or find a leak in the system. Oh, fantastic. And you're probably going to cover that up later on yes, when you're your probably. I can pop it on now and you can see what it looks like. Okay. Just to prevent bugs going in. Yeah, you don't want no bugs. And there you can see we've got a bit of a, um, a locker. A little locker, you know, you can take the missus here. You can, she can, she can make a lovely picnic. We can put it in the back there. Take it out for a nice flight, afternoon flight, and have 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 a couple of sandwiches and a bit of tea. That's right. There we go. So this is what they call the pitot cover. 
And this one's got this registration on it, so. Let's have a look. VHZUP. Okay, moving across here. And we have the double wing biplane here. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, the instruments inside of curiosity. Yeah, okay. At the bottom there. This is just to give you tension on the, the stick because you don't really have trim on this aircraft. Most modern aircraft got trim, but this is just like a spring loaded mechanism to take the pressure off okay. depending on what you're cruising. There's your throttle. Underneath there's your fuel on and off. Okay, you want to make sure that's on. This is just to push to talk outside and to the person in the front cockpit. And this is your altimeter, which you adjust before you take off. There's your airspeed indicator. This is your slip and turn indicator, so you want to keep that one central the whole time and this will indicate which way you're turning. Your compass, um, you has your RPM gauge, normally cruising at about between 1800, 1800 and 1950 RPM. On takeoff you get 2100 normally. Oil pressure gra uh, gauge, over there is what's called an inclinometer. It's one of the things that they used for instrument flying. Oh, and on okay. the right hand side yeah, you've got your, um, your slack control, which takes loosens this up which pops the slats out which are like to prevent you stalling and the, where modern aircraft as you can see over there they got the, the flaps to slow you down okay and these ones just to, so you know when you go slow they pop out so that you don't drop a wing so yeah. yeah i've seen in uh, like some other countries they've actually removed those those slats you know yeah, like yeah, in South Africa. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, saw this I think it's because of doing aerobatics that you've got to lock them oh the okay is why it snaps why doing aerobatics yeah that thing can rip off and smack the wing, the, the slat, so that's what makes it dangerous. Okay, we don't want that. No, and in the English ones, they've got an anti-stall st strike over here, which is just a bit of flat wing over there on both sides. And that's to prevent the aircraft from stalling, so when they were training, there was less chance of stalling, but Australia didn't make them with them. So okay. we don't have it here in Australia. Let's see. I see you've got something in the back there as well. That's what is that to keep keep our rowdy rowdy proud and things like that. Keep them under control. <laughs> Similar to a trudgeon. <laughs> it's actually the stick for the front. You take it out when you're on your own. Okay, there we go. We have a maneuverable stick there. That's right. So you can put a passenger up front, put a stick there uh, when they when they're with you. But if there's nobody up there, you just take it out. And these are the covers that will go on tonight when the aircraft goes to bed. Okay. Yeah, we'll cover it up and keep it keep it nice, keep the dust off. Now, as you can see, there's a no step. You don't want to be standing on that when you climb aboard. Might just put a hole in the fabric or something. That's right. It's usually, this is um, this. It's, it's sensitive underneath here. There's not strength. Where there's oh, strength there. There's oh, always no see. step there, so you can snap some timber pieces underneath there. Okay. You know, critical parts that are part of the, the flying wing, so you don't stand there. Oh, that's good. It's always good to know these things, especially if you're going to go and fly, or go out flying with somebody, just because you don't want to be. Uh, you know, standing where you shouldn't be standing, and so forth. And looking at this tail, this is a so very British tail. It is. You know, you look at most British aircraft, a lot of old aircraft have got this sort of shape. So you can almost distinguish it as being British. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you look at the, your chipmunks. Oh, I don't yes, know. Well, that's the Havilland as well. Yeah. Chipmunk, the Havilland, Mosquito, they have a similar tail. That's it. It's a kind of design. Yeah. Okay, so we're just going to have a, a, a distant shot here, have a look at that. There we go. We're going to wrap it up. Just over there, yeah, I see you've got a fuel tank on top there. The fuel tank's on top, gravity fed, you can see the fuel indicator at the top there. Tells you how much fuel you've got in oh, flying, so you can keep an eye on it. But these Aussie ones, they had a bit of a, they had an extra hopper tank. Yeah, as you can see on the bottom there, that's the fuel in there, to the uh, auxiliary tank. So you've got just a long, what they call a long distance tank. Another, another 45 meters in there. Okay, well, what, how, how long can you fly for, Mark? Like, like, probably four and a half hours. Four and a half hours? That's quite a bit of a time difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off to you, good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, folks, thanks for joining us. I hope that this enlarged a little bit more about the Tiger Cosmos. Thanks to Conrad, the Tiger Moth pilot, uh, giving us a bit of info on that. Give us a thumbs up <laughs> and hit that subscribe button. <laughs> See you next time.